I want to look at a couple scriptures, and then I want to take a little case study on the life of Peter, which is the apostle that I relate most with, um, because he experiences some wins, he experiences devastating losses, um, but he's a guy in the end that just kind of hangs in there enough to walk in the full redemption of Jesus, and it's, and it's a beautiful story, but as we talk about breaking, let's look at this first verse. Let's read this first one out loud together. Ready? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Next one. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Here's your homework. Read Psalm 74. Psalm 74 is a great psalm. It's all about David on the run for, for his life from a couple of kings. He pretends he's crazy and mad to get out of a jam. He gets rescued. He gets delivered. And then he pens these words of comfort, words of hope. And he, and he, and he says things like, I cried out to the Lord. He delivered me from all of my fears. He said, they that look to the Lord, their faces will be radiant. They'll never be put to shame. And he, and he goes on. You will get, if you need hope, how many of you need hope right now? You just need some hope. Psalm 34, read it slow, prayerful, and meditative. It's a great psalm. In fact, little tie-in here. Peter, in his epistles, First and Second Peter, would quote about five verses out of Psalm 34. So, very profound. But what does he say there? What do these verses mean? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Who are brokenhearted people? Those who are wrecked. Those who are crushed. Those who are shattered. Those who have experienced disappointment beyond imagination. They're, they're literally brokenhearted. And it also infers, infers that there is a level of violence in the brokenness. That's happened. You could talk about abuse or the effects of addiction, but these are brokenhearted people. And, and it says the Lord is close. And you look at that, it's like the Lord is close. I just want to ask you a question, and I need you to tell the truth. Okay? How many of you have experienced in some way the presence of God in your lowest moment or in the moment where you just thought it's it's game over? There's no way I'm gonna survive this. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise your hand, lock the elbow. I want everybody to look around because you and I need to be encouraged that whatever you're going through, there's other people that have gone through the exact same thing. And it's true, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And I will tell you from experience, 40 years of walking with Jesus, I can tell you this, I have never experienced his presence in a closer way than when I was absolutely at rock bottom. It's just the truth. Now, the only thing that can interrupt that, I've found and I've watched and I've seen in people's lives, is if you allow yourself to get bitter. If you allow yourself to get bitter and start doing the blame God game, you know, God's not fair. He should, you know, if you, that's the only thing that I can see that can interrupt these two verses right here. I, I've seen it. I've seen other people, and they will cry out in agony, and they will say, I don't understand this, God, but I'm trusting you to come close and help me. Every time. Every time. He's close. If we let him be close. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I'm glad it doesn't stop there. You know what it means? It means all kinds of evil. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. All kinds of evil. All kinds of pain. All kinds of problems. All kinds of misery. All kinds of suffering. Listen, there is no level of faith. And I've heard people preach stuff like this. That literally, if your faith is strong enough, you will never have a bad day. Now, I'll just tell you, that's something I call garbage theology. It's garbage. Because all you have to do is take a cursory look from Genesis to Revelation, and you will see strong men, strong women that get crushed. Righteous people doing all the right things, praying all the right prayers at all the right times, being generous, righteous, holy, etc., 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 and just... A left hook from hell will come and take them out. And you don't even need to believe for it. It's coming. I like what Henry Cloud said. He said this. He said, everybody will experience a train wreck in their life. Pray that it comes early. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers them out of some of them. 
One way or another, God will get his way and he will deliver you. And that, we bank on that. Now let's talk about, I want to talk about Peter. Let's talk about the breaking and the making, okay? And once again, I love this guy, but he failed on so many levels, like you and I. And yet, there's an incredible amount of hope and grace afforded to him by Jesus. So let's just, I'm going to rapid talk through these right here. First one, Peter speaks without thinking. Have you ever done that? I haven't. <laughs> Less than a thousand times. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, this may be 101 to you, but if you find yourself rebuking Jesus, you may just want to rethink that a little bit. He's rebuking Jesus. Far be it from you, Lord, this will never happen to you. And how does Jesus respond? Uh, yeah, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Peter is unreliable when Jesus needs him most. You ever really needed somebody? You ever really gone through something in your life and you really desperately needed somebody right there and they weren't there? Or they said they were going to be there and they no-showed? <laughs> oh, things an old guy would never say. Um, this is Gethsemane. This is only referred to as the agony in the garden. That's all it's ever referred to. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. This is Jesus. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them <laughs> sleeping. This is the A-team, folks. This is the chosen dozen. <laughs> no, th these are first-round picks by Jesus. He could have picked anybody. These are the 12 he picks. And at his most vulnerable place, at his greatest need, the only thing he wants them to do is to be there and to pray. But he finds them sleeping. So then Peter makes promises to Jesus he can't keep. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. You know, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and ever lives to make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wrap your brain around that. Spend a few hours meditating on that for a moment. Jesus is praying for you. And he's praying your faith doesn't fail. He's praying that you make it. He's praying that you go the distance. He's praying that you stay in the game. Now, after all these years of walking with him, I can tell you this. I have more faith and confidence in his character, in his prayers, than I do in my own. Because I know me. And I love this part right here. Here's faith coming out of Jesus. I pray that your faith doesn't fail, and when you have turned again... Strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. I mean, what a great guy, huh? I mean, that, I can count on him. He says, I'll go to prison, I'll die. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day till you deny me three times that you know me. And Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing. <laughs> the, the band of brothers, all for one, one for all, we're here. <laughs> they're not here. <laughs> they're running their mouth. They're just, they're just shooting from the hip. You can count on us, Jesus. We're, we're your guys. <laughs> this is tragic. This is a tragedy. And then it gets worse. <laughs> Peter is violent under pressure. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear.
Okay. So let me get this straight. You go from a prayer meeting to sleeping to attempted murder. I mean, you just, you would just love to just be watching Jesus up close at these moments. You know, what, what is Jesus doing? Peter, what, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I mean, was he exasperated with him? Was he like, yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> he aimed for the head. He got the ear. Okay, he didn't close the deal, but you know what? And then Jesus healed him. And what was the guy's name that got his ear cut off? Malchus, okay, you win something. I don't know what you win, but you win something. But that's what Peter does. This is Peter. This is my guy, okay? Then it says, Matthew 26, a servant girl looked at Peter and said, you are with him. Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him. <laughs> Gosh. Little, little while later, someone else saw him and said, you're one of them. Peter said, man, I'm not. <laughs> now, he just made these outrageous claims like, that many verses ago. I mean, we're talking within the same hour. He's, he's doing crazy. He's talking crazy. He's actually kind of bipolar. No, no. He goes from, I'm up here to get me out of here. He's, he's, he's on the spectrum for sure. He's all over the map. Huh? Only I can say that. Shouldn't I have said that? I'm old. I'm an old guy. Sean said, I'm an old guy. Old guys say things sometimes. Right now, Sean's going, I wish I would have never made the old man comment. After an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man was with him. He's a Galilean. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what's happening? The gap between who Peter says he is and who Peter really is, is widening. It's called incongruence. It's called a lack and a gap of integrity. But that's our guy Pete right here. Then he becomes more emotionally unstable. Then he begins to invoke a curse on himself. You go from making promises to cursing yourself and swear. Potty mouth Peter. <laughs> I don't know the man. And when he was still speaking, cock a doodle doo. <laughs> the rooster crowed. The, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Man, I just wonder what that look was. You know, like, really? Yeah, you did, Peter. I told, I told you. I told you. He curses himself. Rooster crows. Jesus looks at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now you've got shame and regret that are owning his soul. Right there. He's... He's being downsized right here. So you see his failures fully manifested. And then, and this is it right here. Then they seized him, led him away, and bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. Now, here's what I want to know. I don't want to give you a cute little, this is how you get out of it, or this is how you get through it, or this little, you know, here's what I want to know. How many of you would agree, agree that, you know, what we just read there puts Peter in the colossal failure category? I mean, we're not talking a misstep, or we're not talking a oops, or, you know, we're not talking some little infractions. I mean, we're talking about a guy that is on a bad slide down. It's not good. So what I want to know is, okay, he failed miserably. This is a snapshot, man. This is just in the last 24, 48 hours. You can go through the Gospels and you can find more failures. I mean, if you want. You can just find him leading the league in failures and promises and bragging. Here's what I want to know. 
I want to know how does Jesus deal with someone like me? How does Jesus deal with someone like Peter? Now, if it's true that God is no respecter of persons, then we have to look at the way Jesus treats Peter, and we have to say, well, Jesus would treat me the same way. See, Jesus isn't cutting slack to Peter just because, well, you know, he's got some problems and, you know, we just need to give him a little more than we give the others or I really have a high calling for him and so I just need to, no, 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 no. Either the mercy and grace of God is new every day for Peter and me or it's not. See, there will never be a day that you and I live on this planet where we don't need the grace and mercy of God. And if you think there will be a day you don't need that, I will tell you you're deceived out of your mind. And you don't know God at all. No, I think I got a handle on it. You got a handle on nothing. Oh, no, no, no. You have no idea how many scriptures I memorized. Could care less. Seriously, that's good, man. Get your little prize on the way out. That's awesome. But you and I need mercy and grace every single day. I mean, that's just, just the truth. We clap, but we'll take it. So how does he deal? Just remember this. Peter the apostle is also Peter the sellout. He's the same guy. See, what Western church does, knowingly or unknowingly, is they teach us to live a compartmentalized life. And so you have this spiritual side on Sunday. That's where you get all dolled up and you go to church and you look good and you put your little happy face on, you know, and you say things like praise God and, you know, hallelujah and I'm victorious and I got the victory, brother. And then something happens on Monday when you get to work. And then as the days go, there's this little ebb and flow, right? And so we want to put our life into compartments. And I'm telling you, Jesus doesn't, allow you and I to live in compartments. He either accepts us and deals with all of us all the time, or he doesn't. He's all in, or he's not. And I can tell you, Scripture says that he is faithful even when we're not faithful. Now, now, just once again, this is 40 years of wide-angle viewing on the body of Christ. And I'll tell you what people do. This is, you know, I've watched this. People do good. And it's not so much true and since COVID and all that stuff. But there used to be this thing where people that were doing really good would sit on the first couple rows. They would, man. They'd be up front, Bible and notes and all this stuff. And they'd be doing good. And then you'd see the same people that would be in the middle. You go, I wonder why they're in the middle now. And then, same people that were up front, yeah, 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 they're in the back. And then they're coming late. And they're leaving early. This is just an observation. That's all it is. I have found that typically what happens to people is when they're doing good, they like to be seen. I don't mean that in a bad way. When they're not doing good, they don't want to be seen. Because shame always puts you in hiding. It, it just does. Now, the question is, is Jesus shaming? Because if he is, I mean, hit me with it. Seriously, give me a double portion. But if he's not, you got to reverse that thing. Now, either you can come to Jesus in the middle of your brokenness or you can't. He's either going to love you and help you and be close to you and heal you or he's not. I can tell you he is and he wants to. You have to stay in the game. You have to stay there. And it's tragic over the years. You will see people that were doing good and then they got enticed. And Satan has desired to sift them like wheat. What does that mean? To separate. To separate. And I can tell you that anything that separates you or tries to separate you from the love of God, from your commitment to Jesus, is not from God. 
that's just true. That's the devil's goal, separate you. That's why when you screw up, and whatever your version of screw up is, you hear little voices. Oh, if anybody finds that out, oh, give it some time. Just, just go, go in hiding. Stay away. You know, then if you try to worship God, oh, how hypocritical did you see what you did last week? And now you're praising God. You're in the front row praising God now. Is that true? It's just attack. Attack, attack, attack. But once again, how does Jesus, that's the main event, is how does Jesus deal with us in our brokenness? And here's three, three things. <laughs> Jesus lets Peter feel the weight of his own failures and weakness. He doesn't coddle him. He doesn't apologize for him. He doesn't make excuses for him. How many of you know that pain is a great motivator to change? And rock bottom is a gift. No, it is. And, you know, when people say, well, Christianity is just for weak people. Duh. Duh. Really? Your little sanctimonious little, what, really? It's for broken people. It's for diseased people. It's for people so far out of the galaxy of faith. It's for all of that. It's for the addicted. It's for the afflicted. I used to be shocked when people screwed up. <laughs> You're a pastor, and you would like to think that what you preach actually has an effect on people. And so when you see that it didn't, <laughs> then you get mad at them. <laughs> and you say little stupid things like, I can't believe, can you believe they did that? <laughs> You're shocked? I'll tell you this. I'm at the point in my life where I've seen so much and I've looked in the mirror so often. I ain't shocked by anybody's sin. I I'm just not. Because at the end of the day, you know what the Bible says? He remembers our frame, our constitution our flesh. He remembers our frame and that we are dust. Good dust. Created in the image of God kind of dust. The kind of dust that God, God breathed the pneuma of life. But at the end of the day, I think Jesus is more comfortable with your humanity than you are. Well, is that it? That, you're given a license to sin. Pfft. People don't need a license. They've been sinning without a license for a long time. Am I right? No. And, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. Listen. If things are going horrible for you right now, and maybe it is self-induced or demonically induced or whatever, others induced, I can tell you the goal is not for God to crush you, but to heal you. I, I mean, I can tell you that. And sometimes we do got to lose a lot. I mean, whatever that is, we have to lose a lot. And then the healing takes place if we'll turn to him. I mean, really, if we'll turn to him and ask for help, he'll help us. Here's the second thing is Jesus doesn't judge Peter by his good intentions, his best moments, or his worst. He doesn't judge him. He tells him the truth. Get behind me, Satan. This really is what's going to happen. You think you're all that, but this is what's going to happen. He tells the truth. But he doesn't define him by his failures, successes, or good intention. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't define me that way. We're not defined by our best moments or our worst moments. Remember, because we're all one person. We're all, you know, together, all of us. We're the, we're the same. What does he say? The spirit's willing, flesh is weak. That's dripping with grace and reality. Yeah, your heart and your spirit is for God, and it's willing. You want to pray all the time. You want to give all the, all the time. You want to share. You want to love. You want to pray. You want to heal all the time. But the flesh gets a little sleepy at times. That's just the truth. And the third thing is, this is incredible. <laughs> How does Jesus deal with Peter? He pursues Peter despite his failures giving mercy, grace, and a fresh start. Now, 
In John 14, 18, he says this. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay. To leave means to send back. <laughs> Jesus never looks at Peter like a manufactured defect. <laughs> he doesn't send him back. He keeps him. He redeems him. He goes, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to send you back. I'm not going to let go. This is what leave means. When, when Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you, he says, I'm not going to send you back. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to relax my hold on you or pursuit of you. I'm not going to loosen my grip on you. I'm not going to desist from you. What am I saying? You and I are stuck with the relentless pursuit of God's love. That's just true. Yeah. Well, what do you mean stuck? Yeah, stuck. You're stuck with it. Have you noticed that you can't sin the way you used to sin? Oh, he's meddling now. Yeah. No, before you met Christ, you sinned. Man, you it was all good. It was the greatest thing on the planet. Sin and the pleasure that came with it. Then you got saved. Then he washed you, cleansed you, gave you mercy, gave you grace, shed his blood for you, changed you from the inside out. And you experienced this thing called new life. And it's like, wow. And then you got tempted. Somebody says, ah, let's just one more, one more time. Let's just try it one more time. And you went, you went back to the trough one more time. Did you notice it didn't have the same effect? It didn't. You're ruined for sin. You are. You're ruined. Don't look so sad. It's a good thing. <laughs> Never can get to sin like I used to. You don't want to. You really don't. Yeah, you can still get some pleasures and you can still keep going down that road if you want. But at the end of the road, there's Jesus. <laughs> the relentless love of God. They should make a song like that. I'm not kidding. That'd be a great song, wouldn't it? That's what Jesus did. Now, put a bow on it here. Stand up. So, that's Peter's slide. Boom. That's his downfall. Boom. And then you look at what happens after that. Once again, does Jesus bail? Nope. Jesus comes out of the grave. Tells the ladies, ah, go tell Peter what happened. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He, call, he points him out specifically. Why? Because of all the 12, Peter needs the most grace. He needs the most hope. He needs the most life. And so Jesus said, tell, make sure you tell Peter. And then what does Jesus do? Well, he does what resurrected lords do. He walks through walls. <laughs> and it says the disciples are hiding for fear of the Jews. Okay, these are all the guys who said, yeah, we'll die with you. Uh, they're hiding. Jesus walks through the wall. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> How y'all doing? <laughs> and it says he appeared to them three times. And three times, here's what he says. Peace to you, peace to you, peace be with you. Not told you you'd sell me out. <laughs> knew it. Well, you get bragging, but I knew it. No, he says, peace. Calm down, boys. Just calm down. Then what does he do? He disappears for a little while. He's on the shore. He's, wow. That was a Yeti. Um, <laughs> you know. um, so what does he do? He makes a little fire, and then he sees the boys on the boat, and he goes, hey, caught any fish? They're like, Oh, no. <laughs> it's him. <laughs> oh, no. Peter's thinking. Oh, and, then, and then Jesus says, hey, launch your nets on the right side of the boat. And now Peter is just like, oh, this is Luke 4 all over again. Oh, God. no, 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 no. And you remember Luke 4. That's where, that's where Peter reluctantly said, we fished all night. We didn't caught anything. All right. I'll do it, goes out there, catches so much fish, the nets break. And remember, Jesus, remember Peter's response to Jesus? 
depart from me. I'm a sinful man. <laughs> he was busted up over that. And now here you've got another replay. Put down the nets. Oh, we're not going to hesitate this time. They put the nets down. 153 fish. Peter's so excited, he jumps off the boat into the water and swims to shore. <laughs> and then Jesus, what does he do? He cooks some breakfast. Does that sound like a vindictive savior? Does that sound like a Messiah that lacks a little grace and empathy? No. And then he cooks, he cooks breakfast. Eat. Then he says, he broke the bread, and they go, here we go again. And he gives it to them, gives thanks. They eat. And then Jesus has a little walk with Peter, and he just says this. He goes, hey, do you love me? And I love the language. Do you agape love me? Do you love me unconditionally, Peter? Peter's response. Peter is having, like, one of his first sober, insane moments in his life. He goes, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? <sighs> love you like a brother. Then Jesus says, do you love me like a brother? And Peter goes, yeah, I do. That's all I got. See, it's almost like Peter is in full view of all his braggadocious, crazy talk. And now he's been downsized and humbled by the presence of Jesus. And he goes, you know, I mean, really, if we were just cutting out the King James Version, it would be like Peter goes, you know, I know what you want, and I really don't got it. What I do is high five, bro. That's what I got. That's all I got. You know what Jesus does? He doesn't say, you know, why don't you go get that right and meet me here in a week. I love this part. I mean, Jesus takes what Peter's willing to give. That's all he ever wanted in the first place. He didn't want Peter's bragging, vow-making, you know, his, oh, 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 I'm great. He didn't want any of that. He says, you know, come as you are, man. Let's walk together and let's do something great. And then what happens after that? Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 12-ish. Peter stands up, raises his voice, tells people to repent. The former coward, man, is now just calling people out. Repent. Kingdom of God is here. 3,000 people get saved without a marketing plan. It's amazing. So the only thing I want to tell you is if you're running from God, you can run. He'll meet you where you're running, wherever that is. And if you're broken... His presence will bring healing to you. If you lose the bitterness, that's the only thing, I, really, lose the bitterness. So I'd like prayer teams to come on up here, and we're going to pray for you. Maybe you've come up 100 times. You know what? Come 101. If you've never come forward and prayed, these people have all been through it, I think. Mike, you've been through it? Sean, you've been through it? You've been through it? You've been through it? You've been through it? So you've all experienced brokenness, so you don't walk on water? No? Not today? Good. So I'm going to pray. I want to pray for those that really are in a broken-hearted state right now. And you do feel crushed. If you just raise your hands, and I'm going to pray for you, and then I pray that you come down. So if you're experiencing that crushing and that breaking, just lift your hand up. So Father, your word says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I believe as your word was spoken, this morning, I believe people's faith went up. Not because of me, not because this is a slick message, but because of who you are. Because of your undeniable presence. For your desire to love people, to walk alongside them. Not when they're doing good, but at all times. When they're doing bad, good, in between. And I thank you where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Thank you that your word says, and because of the fullness of Christ, you have received grace upon grace. 
Father, I pray that people that have labored under the yoke, the tyrannical yoke of legalism, I pray mercy and grace would break that right now in the name of Jesus. You would loose them from that in the name of Jesus. You know the three words Peter uses the most in his epistles, first and second Peter? Unbelievable. Faith, hope, and love. Why did he use those three words the most? Because that's what he experienced. Faith, hope, and love. And I'm going to tell you, don't walk out today without experience, faith, hope, and love from Jesus. Amen?